Springboard is the senior thesis project that our students work with. And today, um, this month is Women History Month and our panel is filled with young women who are doing research and we are looking forward to hearing what they will be presenting with us today. Um, with us today is Professor Elizabeth Reese alongside instructor Logan McBride and they will go ahead and introduce the students we have here today. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, we have, uh, Charmaine already mentioned this, but this is a senior thesis class that students from all the campuses can take. We've been working since the fall on defining their project and writing an abstract, doing the research. And now what you're going to see today is uh, three students who will introduce themselves. Um, well, and I'll just tell you they're, well, I'll, I'll let them do it. Um, they are, this is, these are practice presentations for a national, a, sorry, a regional conference that we applied to. This year it's gonna be digitally, but normally we would travel someplace. It's a conference of honors college students. And so the conference is coming up in April and now we are at the st stage where we're practicing our presentations. Professor McBride, do you wanna add anything to that? You're on mute, okay. Okay, well, she doesn't have anything to add. Okay, that's fine. Um, okay, so each person's presentation is uh, roughly 12 minutes. And um, I think we'll, we should just save time for questions at the end, just to make sure that we don't run over. Um, Ariane is up first and she's gonna share, introduce herself and share her screen. And take yourself off mute. Oh, Charmaine, you might have to unmute all the participants because that's what happened to me. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Ariane Rothschild. I'm a senior at Hunter College and I'm majoring in accounting. And I'm going to be sharing my thesis presentation on what happened to our food during COVID and who is to blame for what happened. Sorry, I'm just pulling up my screen. Can everyone see it? Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so COVID's impact on the American food economy. Have you ever thought about the bag of shredded cabbage that you bought for dinner last week? How did it get to your plate? Believe it or not, cabbage doesn't grow shredded. It grows on a head, like the picture you see here. Actually, chances are quite high that the bag of cabbage that you bought is made from multiple heads of cabbage, not just one. Thanks to the supply chain, a farmer growing cabbage almost anywhere in the world can have their produce delivered to a grocery store near you, and maybe even your doorstep. Food flows through the supply chain in a domino-like fashion, where each piece relies on the piece before it to have the process continued. First, a farmer has to grow and harvest the cabbage. Then they ship it to a processor who washes, debugs, and shreds the cabbage and places the shredded cabbage into plastic bags. These bags are then sealed and labeled with the expiration date. Next, the cabbage goes to a distributor who ships the shredded, packet, who sh ships the shredded cabbage to a grocery store across the country. Once the shipment arrives at a supermarket, the supermarket employees unpack the cabbage and put it on a shelf. That's where you come in. You browse the supermarket aisles looking for cabbage, placing it into your cart to take home and eat. While it may appear to be neat and consecutive, the ch supply chain pathways are rarely simple nor linear. So these are pictures of two supermarket aisles. And the first question that might come to mind when you look at them might be, how did we get from the left to these fully stocked shelves to the right where there's not one item left? That's not the right question to ask though. For reasons as simple as the panic regarding the unknown, shoppers, ordinary people like you and I feared for what was to come mid and early March. No one knew how long we'd be locked inside of our homes for, and of course we wanted to stock up. The real question, which is what I'm asking, is why did it take so long for shelves to be restocked and the rations on eggs, milk, and baby food to subside? Let's take a moment to look on the, at the logos on this slide. How many of them would you say you recognize? 
and how many do you not? Would you say that the ones that are familiar are the logos of companies you see on food packages in the grocery store and that of supermarkets themselves? Well, the other logos are for the companies that grow, transport, process, and distribute our food. My point here is that there is so much behind the scenes work that happens in getting our food from farm to shelf, and it is demonstrated by the ratios of the types of logos presented on the slide that we really only know a tiny fraction of it. This is a path of farm to table that is illustrated very nicely in this infographic, and it explains each part of the supply chain. We begin with raw materials, such as a cabbage head, liquid milk, a potato. Farmers sell their harvested crop to suppliers, and they have contracts with manufacturers such as Nestle and PepsiCo. Manufacturers turn raw items such as a cabbage head into a coleslaw prepared bagged salad, milk into yogurt or ice cream, and potatoes into frozen fries. These shelf ready items go into trucks and are distributed to distribution centers and from there make their way to local supermarkets and then to you. The supply chain has become so well perfected over the years, it is called just in time food delivery services. And even with an enormous amount of food moving through the system constantly, the different parts of the supply chain each maintained several months worth of safety stock to cope with fluctuations in supply and demand. This picture is of a food distribution center in Selma, Texas. From just this glimpse, we can get a feel for how much food is stored here. They are like Costco's on steroids. These are pictures I took of empty aisles in a Queens Trader Joe's and of a woman's full shopping cart and the shopping cart in front of it is hers too, that was taken in Aaron's Casino Farms in Flushing, Queens. I was propelled to have my senior thesis project on this topic because I was shocked at what I saw around me. Never before had I stood on a two and a half hour line to get into a grocery store and then upon entering was met with practically bare shelves and people stocking up like an apocalypse is starting. I wanted to understand why. And then I wanted to understand why it took seemingly forever to fix. I'm sure many of you also remember the frenzy in supermarkets mid-March or recall trying instead to have your groceries delivered during this time. Shortly after the shelves were wiped clean, Americans went in droves to food banks. For many, it was because they lost their jobs, the primary breadwinner of their household was out of work or sick with COVID. Millions of Americans were going hungry and could not get enough food. The food banks reported to be struggling to keep up with this unprecedented demand. And at this time, it made sense. In addition to every household's personal struggles, as a nation, we still didn't have enough food on, in our grocery stores. And of, co of course, people were looking elsewhere for sustenance. Later in April, articles began reporting that farmers across the country were destroying their crops. Green beans, lettuce, tomatoes were all plowed back into the ground. Onions and zucchini were left to rot and milk was poured down the drain. Eggs were smashed and rendered into pet food. But why? We just established that millions around the country were going hungry. Supermarket shelves were still not stocked to normal standards and everyone still had to eat. So why was the food not being sent to us, to me and you, and everyone else in the United States? Let's explain a little bit more on the wasted milk. COVID was not the only major occurrence to impact the dairy industry recently. Dairy farmers have actually been struggling with the recent crazes of nut, soy, rice, and oat milks, as well as veganism. Over the past 15 years, the number of dairy farms across Wisconsin alone has fallen by 49%. The dairy farms remaining in business struggle to stay afloat financially, especially the family owned farms. The disappearance of government mandated price floors for fluid milk no longer ensures that farmers at least break even. The global market dictates prices now, and cow milk is now valued to be worth less than oat milk. Then, once COVID started and required schools to shut down, there was a tremendous decline in the consumption of fluid milk, as elementary school children are fluid milk's largest consumers. Okay, so then why not make more cheese and ice cream and yogurt and butter? All of the byproducts of milk are at the mercy of the supply chain. The closure of the restaurant industry eliminated the need for so much dairy, and this all trickled back down the train, down the chain to the dairy farmer. These farmers were saddled with more raw milk than they could sell, forcing millions of gallons of milk to be dumped every day, especially since one cannot stop the production of milk. Dairy cows need to be milked multiple times a day. Even if farmers tried, and some did, to have their milk sent out to be pasteurized and then to supermarkets just like that, 
there were not enough quarter, half gallon, and gallon jugs available to stock a supermarket. Some farmers have even lobbied pizza chains to put more cheese on every slice in efforts to reduce waste, but this is to no avail. To explain the incredible amount of food waste across all sectors of farming though, it boils down to two reasons, both of which are because of the structure of the food supply chain. Let's revisit the diagram and follow its path. To get from one stage to the next, the food needs to be transported by truck drivers. Food manufacturers work in cramped spaces to process food as quickly as possible on assembly lines. The food distributors also work closely together to organize and allocate food to its penultimate destination. All of these jobs are done by real people who are also at high risk for, con for contracting and spreading COVID. Many of them did not want to go to work as the pandemic raged for fear of their own safety. The hard truth though, is that they needed their jobs and we needed their contribution and still do. It took companies some time to figure out how to make workplaces as safe as possible, ensure that their employees showed up and keep the food moving. Also, supermarkets are not the only retailer. Restaurants, cafeterias, and stadiums are all other primary sources of food purchases prior to the pandemic. With lockdowns in place and the closure of every other food retailer, people had no choice but to get food from supermarkets. The supply chain was not at all prepared for the shift of, for reasons as simple as packaging. In a supermarket, eggs are sold by the dozen or dozen and a half containers. The eggs sent to larger catering operations come in enormous flat crates. And even though families were stocking up, they didn't have space in their fridge to keep an enormous flat crate. So who is to blame for the sluggish restocking of shelves, the rations that went on for too long and the wasted food? As people, we tend to point fingers. We like a good scapegoat. Why is it that no one person or company or farm or industry was blamed for what was going on with our food? Article after article came out about the rise in cases, struggling economies, lines at food banks, and the struggling, struggles of maintaining our food supply system. Yet not, not one of these articles pointed a finger. As demonstrated by this mini timeline, America had approximately three months to prepare for the pandemic. We could have looked to Italy and China for guidance. Why weren't we better prepared? These quotes are examples of the differing perspectives of the reliability of the food supply chain at the onset of COVID. The first one, what a crisis like the novel coronavirus reveals about the food system rather than its weak points is actually its flexibility and, and strength under pressure. And the second, while we may have the food supply available, will we have the workers to get it to us? So while Randall exudes confidence in the system, which has been in place for decades, Lusk raises a pressing concern. The workers across every stage in the system are concerned for their safety. The buried truth is that in the few months leading up to the lockdowns in this country, many companies were ramping up production, increasing the amount of flowers and pastas they produced, for example. Rather than operating for five days a week, they switched to seven, and this drastically increased their output. Even without this, as we said before, the food supply chain always has approximately four months of ready to go food in storage across the various sectors of the supply chain. So what happened? It ultimately boils down to the lack of information we had. No one can really imagine what was to come, how bad it would get, and that food still, needs to, food still grows and needs to be harvested. And all of this was planned well before the pandemic started and that most of us were not really eating more than pre-pandemic. We just panicked. We hoarded, we stockpiled, we tried to be prepared. The system did right itself in a matter of months, and sure we can blame the media, or the government, or the World Health Organization. It wouldn't accomplish much though. So what can be learned from this? How can we fix the system to ensure that this doesn't happen again? Which it likely will, and we did see it again in Texas, and it happens on much smaller scales every time there is a natural disaster approaching. This question is a work in progress. Lots of scholars, economists, Environmental activists have been asking this question. The supply chain must adapt on each level to become more resilient and fair to, to the, all those who bring your food to you. From my research, I have gathered that it is not as possible as eating local and less processed foods. While it may be better for our health than that of the planet, it also may not be possible, nor would it be beneficial to all those Americans whose livelihood comes from making your food. Maybe though, it starts with awareness and appreciation for every single food we eat, no matter how close to the source or processed it is. Because either way, 
It took a lot of effort to bring it to you. Thank you everyone for listening. I hope you enjoyed and learned something. Thank you. That was very good. Your slides are fantastic, I think. Excellent. Um, okay. Uh, Anna, you're going to be up next. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Anna Lukai. I am a senior at the City College of New York where I'm studying political science and public policy. And my thesis is titled The Chinese Diaspora in Peru, Dissecting Culture and Self-Identity. So why this topic? Well, I am a Peruvian born Chinese woman who immigrated to Peru, um, from Peru to New York City when I was three. And because I left Peru at such a young age, I never got the chance to fully understand and engage in Chinese Peruvian culture. So my motivations for pursuing this very particular topic for my thesis is to somewhat fulfill this cultural and identity gap through a bit of self-exploration, research, and reflection. I also wanted to bring more attention to the fact that there is a long-standing history and significant Chinese presence in a Latin American country like Peru amidst the larger global Chinese diaspora. Ultimately, my thesis serves as a self-exploration piece and a journey I hope you are willing to come along for the ride. So my thesis statement is as follows. In Peru, the Chinese's utilization of cultural fusion as a survival tactic against Sinophobia was necessary for the development and growth of Chinese Peruvian culture and identity to this day. While this might not entirely make sense right now, the pieces will come together as I continue through my presentation and provide more context. So for a breakdown of how I structured my thesis, there are three major components. First being history, second being food, community, and family, and third being identity. So history starts with the coolie trade. The existence of Chinese Peruvians goes back to the mid 19th century when the Chinese first arrived in Peru to address labor shortages following the abolition of slavery in Peru. Most of the Chinese immigrated from Southern China from places like Macau and Guangdong um, Chinese laborers came to be dubbed as coolies, which was derived from the Chinese phrase for bitter labor. The coolie trade between Peru and China was part of a larger coolie trade happening globally at the time, with over 1.5 million Chinese men sent overseas in what became a systematic method of sourcing contract workers from Asia. At least 80% of the Chinese sent to Peru ended up working in sugar plantations, while others mined guano, which is bird excrement, built railroads and worked on cotton plantations. Despite slavery being outlawed in Peru, the treatment of the Chinese laborers largely resembled the treatment of those who would be enslaved with the weak silver lining of compensation. The brutal treatment of the coolies reflected the attitudes and sentiments the Peruvians held towards the Chinese, which were largely rooted in xenophobia and the ra racialization of the Chinese as ra racially inferior to the Peruvians. Of course, the Chinese laborers did not sit idly by whilst being treated as second-class citizens, valued solely for their labor, and even then they were still seen as dispensable. There were, there were staged rebellions and concerted resistance efforts, many of which were pretty violent, but there was never a collective mass uprising to thwart the whole plantation and labor system in Peru. In 1874, the Tianjin Treaty of Friendship and Commerce is what officially ended the coolie trade to Peru from China, but the attitudes and overall treatment towards the Chinese in Peru remained largely the same. So following the end of the coolie trade, the labor contracts for the coolies were expiring. And while some agreed to renew their contracts, um, others wanted to leave the back backbreaking labor and poor comp compensation behind. So many opted to migrate internally to urban cities such as Lima, the capital of Peru to pursue better opportunities. Simultaneously, the racialization of the Chinese highlighted how important it was for them to break out of the confines of stereotypes and tropes that the Peruvians had labeled them with. 
I opted to analyze three main avenues, the Chinese token pursuing both socioeconomic mobility and combating Sinophobia all under, under the umbrella of cultural fusion. So the first is food. Um, opening restaurants, small restaurants or fondas as they were called, uh, became a safe bet for the Chinese who moved to the cities seeking to sustain themselves whilst also being able to cook dishes that practice culinary traditions of China. Uh, these fondas largely cook chifa cuisine, which you see two examples on the left, um, which is Chinese Peruvian fusion food. Um, chifa cuisine definitely ex exemplifies the cultural fusion between the Chinese and Peruvians. Um, as you may know, food is often one of the biggest markers of culture and chifa is definitely an integral part um, of the development and um, sustained existence of Chinese Peruvian culture. Additionally, fondas and chifa cuisine provided meals for all Peruvians, especially the working class and the poor. Through food, solidarity building across racial and socioeconomic lines um, between the Chinese and Peruvians was able to occur and improve relations slowly but surely. So these fondas were um, largely centered around Calle Capon in what would be known as, what would grow to be bar Barrio Chino, which is essentially the Chinatown. Aside from the food and restaurant industry, the Chinese also looked within their own communities to preserve their ties to Chinese culture and identity. Societies, associations, organizations became highly important for the Chinese to not, in order to not be completely cut off from um, you know, their homelands and their heritage. Lastly, for this section, um, families were also a part of the continued persistence of the Chinese in Peru. And to put it more bluntly, it was interracial relationships that also contributed to the growth of the Chinese Peruvian population. Um, when the Chinese first arrived in Peru, they were essentially all men and it remained that way for years to come. While the Chinese were treated as second-class citizens for decades, they were still able to marry Peruvian women as Peru did not forbid interracial marriages. These Chinese men, in order to establish a continued Chinese presence and grow families in Peru, sought to marry Peruvian women with the main intention to produce children with Chinese heritage, even if they were mixed. I definitely recognize that in many ways, these relationships and family building were very, very transactional and kind of served as a means to an end. But I thought it was also equally important to highlight the more arguably grim aspects of the factors behind the Chinese's continued presence in Peru. Finally, we come to identity. Um, you know, taking all this history that I've been talking about into consideration, what does it mean to identify as Chinese Peruvian and what does it mean to hold on to this intercultural identity, recognizing that Peru has a history of anti-Chinese sentiment and recognizing how the Chinese historically were able to survive in the face of rampant Sinophobia for decades. In essence, how does the past play into the present? When it comes to things like identity, it is ever in flux, constantly changing and growing. And I wanted to showcase this continual change and development by incorporating my own personal photos from my time in Peru and comparing and contrasting them with historical photos or more modern photos. So on this slide is a photo of Barrio Chino. One on the left is from the 70s, one on the right is from 2002, and that's a photo of my grandma and Barrio Chino. Um, I thought it was super cool because I actually stumbled upon the photo on the left just last night, and I realized that it's actually the same location and it's taken from the same angle as the photo I have of my grandmother. Um, and I thought that was a little mind blowing and it got me really excited to dig deeper into searching for more historical photos because it's definitely more difficult not having direct access to like Peruvian archives and solely relying on internet research. So while time has passed um, from my time in Peru to now, um, the slide and the next also show how little has actually changed as well. Um, I am miles away from my birthplace and two decades removed from my experiences there. And that really exemplifies change. But even though I can't physically be there, I can look towards avenues like using Google Maps to see that many things actually have remained quite the same. Um, physical movement to a new home affects how one views their own identity. 
Uh, but for me, knowing that there are familiar parts of Peru that have not really changed kind of elicits a sense of comfort for me, much like how the Chinese in the past sought comfort in continuing on their own cultural tr traditions, whether that was through food or otherwise. Finally, to close out, I am ending with this photo that I hold very near and dear to my heart. If anything, I think this is the best photo I have that perfectly exemplifies to me what it means to be Chinese Peruvian and what and it encompasses the themes throughout my whole presentation regarding history, food, community, and family. And that is this photo of my family's Chifa restaurant. Um, that's my grandmother, grandmother, my older sister, and I in the storefront. With Chifa specifically, I think of the way my Chinese immigrant parents thought to turn to food to make a living and how that deeply reflects the pathways many Chinese took to survive decades earlier. The existence of a cuisine with roots in the, in the 19th century still pr being present at the turn of the 21st century and to today is a testament to the strength of cultural fusion. My dad, he still cooks lomo saltado for us to this day. And my mom surprises my sister and I with a very popular Peruvian drink called Inca Cola every once in a while. And every time that happens, I am reminded of what it means to be a part of this very, very unique Chinese diaspora and Chinese Peruvian culture and identity. I myself am a product of a decades long persistence and survival in a history etched with rampant Sinophobia. I would not be here, at least not as an individual who holds onto her Chinese Peruvian identity so strongly if it wasn't for the long and turbulent history of those who came before me in Peru. Finally, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the very recent events that have deeply disturbed me on a very personal level regarding the violence that happened in Atlanta, Georgia this week. It does not escape me the direct connections my presentation has with you know, recent targeted Asian violence. And I feel very compelled to just acknowledge these connections. Um, you know, the Chinese diaspora is undoubtedly part of a larger Asian diaspora. And knowing that most of the victims in Atlanta were Asian immigrant and women targeted specifically for being Asian women really shakes me to my core, especially being an Asian immigrant woman myself. So I really hope if possible um, that you take some time to check in on your Asian friends and just recognize that Wherever you are, um, whether that's Peru or the US or otherwise, history has continually been etched with xenophobia and anti-Asian sentiments that are still maintained to this day. And I hope you take away that this is not a new issue at all and have learned a bit more about it on a global level. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. That was fantastic. I'm, I'm very happy that you drew the connection to what just happened in Atlanta, because I was about to say that the history of this horrible and unfortunate ongoing anti-Chinese sentiment is particularly welcome to learn about during this time. And so I appreciate your topic. Um, and I also want to emphasize the importance that you that you brought out of surviving in the face of this racism and your, your uh, your presentation did a great job of, of showing that as well. And I also just want to say to the audience before we go to our last one, is that students have very different motivations for choosing their springboard top projects. And that's what Professor McBride and I like so much about um, teaching springboard because, you know, some people might have an intellectual engagement with their topic. Well, everybody ends up having an intellectual engagement with it, but some might have a personal one. Some might have like what Ariane just showed like something that came up because of COVID. This, you know, if we, if she had been in springboard last year, her topic would have been completely different. Um, anyway, people, students have wide latitude, uh, which makes for very interesting projects. Okay, so now our last one, um, Gianna. Hi everyone, I'm Gianna Fracoviri. Um, while I'm sharing my screen, I just wanna say, um, I'm just so happy that I got to see Ariane and Anna's presentations as well. They're so amazing. I'm so glad to be in this class. Um, and all right, hopefully everyone can see my presentation here. And present. Okay. 
All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, again, I'm Gianna. I'm a senior at Queens College. Um, and today I'll be talking about my research on institutional isolation and injustice among mentally ill women in prison with a focus on the Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women, which is located in New York State's Westchester County. Um, so first I'd like to start off something with uh, that Professor Reese just alluded to. Um, I wanna open this conversation in talking about how over the past year, people everywhere have experienced some form of social isolation as a result of the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, so this public health crisis has caused many of us to reflect on how um, it makes us feel to be isolated from people we love and society at, in general. Um, and for me, I, I realize how much this can impact mental health. So because of my personal experiences during this pandemic, I became interested in the stories of incarcerated women um, because in, in many ways they've endured more forms of isolation than many of us will ever experience in our, in our entire lifetimes, even when the pandemic eventually, hopefully comes to an end. So as a way of exploring the complicated connection between mental illness, incarceration and isolation among women, I've been working on a case study of the Bedford prison within the historical parameters of the 1950s to the present day. Um, and my final project will take the form of a history paper that draws on sources such as scholarly journal articles, books, newspaper clippings, court cases, and important research done by um, activist groups, um, as well as personal memoirs from incarcerated women themselves. So this paper will be supplemented by a virtual timeline that will allow other students to engage in this topic visually as well. Oops, I'm sorry. So first, I, I wanna begin with a brief overview of my project to explain why I made certain choices regarding the parameters of the study and what my ultimate goals are here. So you can see a, an image of the prison uh, from recent years here while I speak. So first of all, I'm focusing on incarcerated women in particular because of the long and well-known legacy of discrimination against women within the social, legal, and economic, even domestic spheres of American society. Um, I'll speak to the extent of this inequity within the criminal justice system as we go on, but just keep in mind that even though men suffer from institutional iso isolation and injustice as well, um, women have had to deal with this oppression on the basis of sex, both inside and outside of prison. So an example of this is a 2006 special report from the US Department of Justice found that 73% of females in state prisons had mental health problems compared to only 55% of males. Um, while this is alarming for both women and men, uh, I do believe that the most likely explanation for this is that the mental health of females is at a greater risk before and during incarceration. Also, I'll be using the term incarcerated women to refer to the inmates who have, who have been or are currently being held at Bedford, although I am sensitive to and respectful of the fact that this group encompasses individuals with a diverse array of sexual and gender identities. So as New York State's only maximum security prison for women, Bedford has a unique history that takes somewhat of a roller coaster ride throughout the 20th century. Its national reputation has served as everything from a model prison for women to a dark example of institutional neglect and abuse. Next, my interest in mental health justice for incarcerated women stems from my personal passion to work towards a future that values safe psychological treatment environments for all people. I should mention I'm a psychology major and a history major. So I'm trying to intertwine my interests in this uh, thesis project. So due to the critical situation faced by all women presently in prison and the vulnerable girls for generations to come, I really hope that my case study will contribute to educational resources for both targets of institutional injustice and allies against it. Overall, I argue in my project that institutions must be eradicated because they will they perpetuate injustice against women suffering with mental health issues. So next, I just want to situate my argument within the larger academic conversations that are going on in this field. So I've learned a lot about the ways in which the history of women in prison differs from that of men by reading the work of criminal justice scholar, Nicole Hahn Rafter. Uh, her book here is Partial Justice, the one in blue. Um, so in this book, Rafter basically rewrites the history of, um, of women's prisons um, in order to counter misconceptions that are held by traditional male dominated studies. 
Refter also discusses the women's reformatory phase of history at length, which marks the start of Bedford's story um, in the early 1900s. So also working to expand upon and improve traditional narratives of history, legal scholar Bernard Harcourt explains how combining rates of mental hospitalizations and prison incarceration paints the image of consistently high rates of confinement or isolation as I refer to it in this project since the 1950s. So elaborating on this concept, Anne E. Parson in her book From Asylum to Prison on the left here adds important issues um, lenses of politics and race to this conversation, noting that most incarcerated people who have been diagnosed with mental illness since the 1950s have been disproportionately African American and under the age of 40. Overall, Harcourt and Parsons research supports the idea that categories of mentally ill and criminal have served parallel functions over time. So now I want to talk about the gender specific issues of incarceration um, and really unpack why women in prison need specialized attention. So this graph that you can see here is from a 2018 report called The Gender Divide, which was published by the Prison Policy Initiative Activist Group. So this graph provides a visual of this historical development of the great disparity we see today between men and women state prison growth. It shows that the women's population has exploded to be over nine times the size that it was in 1978, which more than doubles the rate of growth for men. So while the specific physiological health care needs of women are different from that of men when it comes to things such as reproductive health, women also require gender specific mental health care as well because social cycles of abuse disproportionately impact women and girls, especially those who are of racial minorities and low socioeconomic status. This elevates the level of isolation and injustice faced by women in prison to, to be a multifaceted issue of gender, class, race, and domestic life. Okay, so although my project focuses on mental health and social constructions of female criminality in Bedford from since the 1950s, I do feel it's necessary to kind of contextualize uh, the focus of my research and my case study within uh, the longer history of the 20th century. So for example, in 1909, the National Committee for Mental Hygiene headquarters was founded in Manhattan. And this basically established New York State as the progressive leader of social programs and marked the ideas of social and mental hygiene, basically described as the cleansing of society from what was perceived to be abnormal at the time as the national standard of treatment in America. So two key players in New York's individual history um, pictured here, one of them is Catherine Bement Davis, who was the first superintendent of Bedford when it was still a reformatory and John D. Rockefeller Jr. Um, as we all know, the Rockefellers have a big part in New York State history, um, who funded the opening of a laboratory of social hygiene that was on the grounds of the Bedford Reformatory. So under Davis, the women held at Bedford were subject to experimental psychological testing that aimed to advance research in connecting psychology and criminality. So that combined with the reformatory goal of uplifting fallen women to middle-class standards of female purity created harmful stigmas that continue to haunt the women of Bedford to this day. So next, um, getting into a little bit of the research that I've been doing. Um, so while I maintain my argument that mass decarceration serves as the best long-term defense against tragic and cyclical abuse of women in prison, I do wanna spend some time examining the small triumphs that have happened during the latter half of the 20th century uh, that work towards justice and illuminates a hopeful future in which activism and overall awareness can lead to positive changes. So here I included two newspaper headings from the New York Times uh, from the, the 1970s, and they highlight issues of inadequate mental health treatment and gender-based discrimination at Bedford. So even though earlier abuse happening during the reformatory era of Bedford that I just mentioned before uh, was pretty much swept under the rug, the attention that was drawn by scholars and media watchdog groups helped legal action to take place to help women in prison during the 60s and 70s. So in response to unfair and inhumane treatment inside of Bedford, incarcerated women and their allies pursued court cases against the New York State Department of Corrections. So furthermore, this period of speaking out about, well, against really what really happens in prisons, um, opened the door for more incarcerated women to share their stories about how institutional injustice and isolation has negatively impacted the mental health of women, which is what I'm focusing on primarily. 
So on this slide, I'm going to talk about the part of my research that I'm just really passionate about. Which in, I'm taking a deep dive into the personal accounts um, and the complex interpretations of isolation from the perspectives of incarcerated women themselves. So um, I explored the personal narratives from women who spent more than 10 years incarcerated at Bedford, including Jean Harris, Elaine Bartlett, and Donna Hilton. Um, Elaine Bartlett, who's, you can see her um, story in Life on the Outside over here, that kind of draws a parallel between uh, earlier Rockefeller um, that I mentioned in the mental hygiene area, Rockefeller policies that kind of are discriminating against um, women of color and of low socioeconomic status that has continued into the 70s, 80s, 90s, and today. It was just something that was continuously happening throughout the 20th century. So her story can really chronicle that because her incarceration came about because of the harsh Rockefeller drug laws that are, I, I could talk about that at length, but I don't have time here. So um, um, I also read scholarly work from inmates such as Judy Clark and Kathy Boudin who discussed the AIDS crisis inside Bedford in the 80s and 90s, um, as well as re a report published by incarcerated women about the impact of education in prison. So many of these women have gone on to work as decarceration activists um, after serving time at Bedford but I wanna highlight how their intimate accounts are a window into the disturbing power of institutions that transcend social and physical isolation by emotionally isolating women from themselves and others. Um, and it's really heartbreaking to, to hear these personal accounts in their memoirs. Um, so speaking to the urgency of decarceration to prevent further damage to women, uh, Donna Hilton in her memoir here, A Little Piece of Light, um, who spent, she spent 27 years at Bedford and I wanna quote her saying, we must keep working to get the women out, out of prison and out of the cycle of violence in their lives and in our society. No matter what the past holds, we have to be part of the future solution. Okay, so I just briefly wanna mention forms of extreme isolation. So um, in addition to the uh, normal isolation that are faced by all women in prison, the special housing unit at Bedford serves as the most severe form of confinement at the prison. It's separate from the general population. And there are a lot of many ac um, academic conversations about the ethics of putting women who suffer from mild to severe forms of mental illness in this extremely cut off environment. Um, and some of the women I mentioned a moment ago discussed their own harrowing experiences in the special housing unit or the box as it's called by um, incarcerated women in their memoirs. So I just wanted to mention this as an extreme but prevalent form of isolation that puts all women in prison at great risk and might be a place to start um, making changes. So taking all of this into careful consideration, the path of activism and reform that lies ahead is not an easy one, but it's crucial to fighting for human rights. More research, education, and overall social concern over injustice faced by women in prison will help to open the eyes of citizens and policymakers alike. Women caught up in the criminal justice system should not be given more problems to deal with by facing isolation in its extreme forms while suffering with mental illness. So I hope that my research and the virtual timeline that I'll be constructing as an educational tool for activism and reform will continue to contribute to this cause. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Gianna, that was fantastic too. I think that you did a great job um, merging your interests in psychology and history. And I would also say human rights work uh, to that as well. Thank you so much. Very good. Um, okay, so there's 10 minutes left and um, I think this would be a good time for questions to any of our panelists. Yeah, you should put your, there, yeah, good. Um, so there is a question um, that was raised and I'll just read it out loud. And this was actually um, congratulating Anna on a great presentation. Do you know what is the population of Chinese people in Peru right now? And where specifically in Peru has the most population of Chinese people? Yeah, I think um, it's kind of hard to give a, a straight response because um, you know, like Chinese heritage goes way back in Peruvian history. So some people might be like, like 1% Chinese. So like, it really depends on how they self-report themselves in Peru's census. Um, but in 2017, 
um, the census um, reported that around 14,000 people said that they had like Chinese ancestry um, and were also living in Peru, but the Peruvian embassy, at least as of 2009, estimates that there are over 10%, 10, over 10% of Peruvians currently have Chinese ancestry. So like at least one in 10 Peruvians. Um, as for like greatest population um, in Peru of the Chinese, I'd say probably like Lima, the capital. Um, that's also where Barrio Chino is located. So, but I, I'd wager to say that there are probably even more Chinese people with Peruvian roots abroad, as historically there have been migration trends of Chinese Peruvians immigrating from Peru to countries like Canada and the US, very much like me. <laughs> Thank you for your question. There's also another question. Also, sorry, Anna, they're coming in for you. Coming to the US so early, did you retain the languages of your multiple heritages? Yeah, thank you for, for asking, Stephanie. Um, yeah, so I think it's interesting. My very first language was Spanish, and then it was Cantonese, and then it was English, but um, it's kind of backwards now. I'm most fluent in English. Um, I converse in Cantonese with my parents, and the only Spanish I practice is during my Spanish classes at school. Um, but definitely, like, um, me studying Spanish is definitely my my way of trying to retain my very first language. Um, whether or not I'm doing a good job at it is a different conversation, but um, I, I'm definitely like, that's my attempt at trying to retain everything. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So there is another question. Um, this is for Ariane. Um, do you think effective change is being made in the food supply chain so that we can prevent the food shortages we saw, particularly during the early days of COVID? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, actually, I don't know that there is much change happening within the food supply chain now. I think that it may have boiled down, especially with COVID, to lack of information that people just, we didn't know how long we would be home for. And what does that mean that you can't go out of your house? There's nowhere to go. So of course, everyone wanted their food stocked up in their house. Um, but I think if there were to be another looming crisis that we would all would know about, we would have a better idea of stores may also put rations on everything and just maybe close the stores and a little earlier and just try to limit and make everything a little more orderly for going forward because I'm sure we all can agree it was ridiculous to go shopping in March. There's another follow-up question for you, so sorry. Um, it says, what was the reason for your presentation? Did you have friends or family members that were affected by the food grocery shortages? I actually don't know of anyone personally that didn't have enough food. I think everyone kind of got enough food. I remember being in a grocery store with my mom early March when news about how bad it was in Italy was coming out. And I told her, mommy, we need to get canned everything. We need pasta, we need rice, we need beans, we need mushroom. Just if, if it comes in a can, we gotta put it in the cart. And my mom looked at me as I was, you know, going through the shelves, just kind of dumping it into the cart. Like you're crazy, everything's gonna be fine. And we were both right and both wrong. So I think it was also my fear of being in a supermarket back then. And the panic I felt that I wanted, I just wanted to understand what happened and why I was so nervous. And then again, when I went back into a store, when you, where's all the food? Thank you. So this is a question for all of the panelists and I'm gonna put it to Gianna first. It's, um, Yuki said, amazing presentations. What was the most difficult part of doing research or putting together your project? Okay, thanks for the question, Yuki. Um, so I think for me personally, the most difficult part of the research process um, was just like balancing the emotional investment in, in hearing such personal stories from women that have gone through so much as, as incarcerated individuals. Um, and then 
bringing that to the forefront of my project in a way that re both respects it and also um, calls for change. So um, that it's, it was like uh, very difficult to, to hear a lot of, of that, of the horrible things that happened to women, um, but it's also like something that I feel like needs to be shared. So that's what motivated me to like push through that. But, um, and then I think there, there's two parts to that question possibly, I'm not sure, or I don't know if I, I'll just pass it on, okay. Yeah, for me, um, I think it was just like knowing what was available for me to research because my topic, you know, it's a country miles away. Um, most of the content is in Spanish and I'm not like super fluent in Spanish or anything. So, and a lot of it is, there's a lot of historical context um, to my thesis project. So trying to figure out how I could even find anything in the first place was probably the most difficult part for me. Um, but luckily I was able to like dig really deep into the depths of the internet and was able to find content. For me, I would have to say um, my struggle was kind of in line with Gianna's. It was balancing an emotional aspect of my research also. I, I don't know if any of you have read it, but a New York Times article came out in April called Dumped Milk, Smashed Eggs, Plowed Vegetables, Food Waste of the Pandemic. And after reading that article, I broke into tears. I was so angered at how much food was being wasted. I also, um, in April, volunteered at a um, soup kitchen in Queens and the amount of people that were coming for food and knowing also that it was being wasted just made me so upset. Um, but I think I also struggled with finding accurate concrete research. And I remember asking professors, all of my articles are, all of my sources are like current news articles. Is that, is that okay? And they told me, yes, this is currently happening and this is what it is now. And these are as close to firsthand accounts as you can get because I couldn't, I did reach out to farmers across the country and I did not receive any responses, but it was the research and then also emotionally finding out what was happening. Thank you so much. So there are a few more questions. I know time is going, but let me just see how much we can get done. So there's a question on how much assistance and or guidance did you receive from your advisor on choosing your thesis? And this is for the for everyone that, that want to answer. I, I can go first. Um, I would say that the professors really held our hands and uh, really helped us figure out exactly what we wanted to do and hone in on exactly our topic. And the class is so well designed that we were able to go from early August, late August when we started this class, I had no idea. I knew I wanted to do something about food. I didn't know how much exactly I wanted it to revolve around COVID. But the more I was told, like, just, just look, and then it totally made my project want to be about the food supply chain and what happened to our food. So they were excellent in guiding us the whole way. Also, the class is very scaffolded. So um, it was very approachable. I, I think back to like the first week of classes, I I had like interests floating in my head. Um, but I like, like Ariane said, I had really no sense of how I could put a tangible pro how, how I could how my interest could result in a tangible product but um here I am you know on this panel and that's I think that's a testament to how well Springboard is run. Can't even tell you how gratifying it is to hear all this and and just even without you all saying it just seeing your presentations is so fantastic because we do remember vividly how most people who join the class in, in August are like, eh, you know, I want to do something about food or I want to do something about mental health, you know, just something so vague. And then we work and work and work and do more research until it's an actual manageable project that you can do, you know, in the next months. And, and here you are. Excellent. I also, I also would like to say that I think it's I mean, we, we very much appreciate you, <laughs> what you said about the class and we also want to congratulate you and the other folks in the class because one of the ways that we structure the class is to really provide mutual support um, among this, you know, for the student to support each other. Uh, and I think they've done a really excellent job of that. 
um, and it's called, I think Professor Reese said it's springboard. We hope that they springboard to something else sort of in their own personal academic or professional lives, but also we're seeing a lot of springboarding into activism and uh, desire to kind of do something with this uh, information, this research that they've acquired. So it's really exciting to see how the class has supported uh, each other through that process. So I know we're at 12 o'clock and you are still, you still have your class taking place. So um, there were three questions left, but if you have to go now, because you still have your class, I know some of them are on here as well. Do you want to take one more or two or is that time? Um, we, we probably have time for one, one more question. Let's just choose one of these. Okay, so if you want to choose which one you like. Okay, well, there's two that have to do with Gianna. So one is about uh, legislation pushing for the for the end of solitary confinement and how that affects women. And then the other one for Gianna also um, has to do with uh, putting women in prison because of, with women with mental health issues in prison because there's no place else for them to go. Um, and it, do you think that's a means of social control? Maybe you could just quickly answer both of those. I know they're huge topics and questions. Sure, of course, yeah. So um, I know I wasn't able to like spend too much time on either one in my presentation, but I'll briefly say that um, social control theory definitely informed a lot of my research, um, how the concept of mental health is both legitimate in a medical sense, but also socially constructed, unfortunately, in a lot of ways that um, discriminate against women over time. So that's something that I focus on a lot in my paper. Um, and I do, in terms of the solitary confinement issue, I've been, since I'm focusing on um, a historical sort of uh, window, um, I'm not super well versed in like the current legislation coming out about it, but I have read a report by the New York Civil Liberties Union called Boxed In, and I, I've learned a lot from that as well. So it seems like things will be getting better for both men and women. Um, it just starts with, you know, a lot of awareness coming out. Uh, before anything can really change. So thank you for the questions, I appreciate it. So with that, I would like to thank all of the panelists. Thank you, Dr. Reese. Thank you, Logan McBride for joining us today. And we will have an upcoming event on Monday, looking at another inside look to one of our upper level honors courses, Impact Documentaries, and I hope you'll join us. And if there's any juniors here with us today, I hope you got an insight to what the fall will bring and how Springboard and the community and the trust um, in that community will help you with your research. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Charmaine, for hosting us. Thank you.